Live from the outhouse in Slumdog Millionaire, it's the IGN Digital. So please welcome Vicky Cristina Barcelona, Wade Major, and Mark Kaiser. <laughs> Good week, bad week. Just um, you and you, you in general. Nothing pertaining to DVDs. Oh me? Yeah. Uh, good week. Good week at the office. <laughs> Friendly people, smiling faces. I don't know. I don't talk to anybody at the office. You don't. I just do my job and then leave. You just, just walk in, grumble, grumble, shut the door. Oh, it's no grumbling and okay. no, no door shutting. I just okay. do. I'm a professional. I do my job and I leave. Okay. That way I can leave and go see movies. I see. Like, uh, we'll be seeing Sucker Punch soon. You're an evil man for even reminding me of that. <laughs> Zack Snyder. Ugh. You know, if it wasn't for Christopher Nolan somehow putting his stamp of approval on it, I, 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 don't, I would just totally check out of that movie. Uh, the Superman movie we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm already checked out. Just uh, the, Let's put it this way. You, you know, like, when you walk past a big steaming pile of canine um, defecation... And you really, you could take the sweetest smelling perfume or cologne from the most expensive counter at the most expensive store in town, and you could pour it all over it, and it would still smell like poo. Uh, that, that's how I feel about that Nolan Zack Snyder thing. There's, there's nothing that Nolan could do to override the sheer horrible stinkiness that will be a Zack Snyder movie. I mean, Nolan's, that, that, that's, like, that's like the comedy pairing of like, you know, Lenny Bruce and Gallagher. Yeah. I mean, there's just like, you know, Steve Martin, Carrot Top. Yeah. You know, that's like the, the, the musical, know. the musical pairing of like, you know, you two and, you know, Bismarcky the, and, and Bismarcky. Yeah. That's the worst. I know. I know. I and hear by you. the way, tell us how full of crap we are at gods at digigods.com. Oh, no. Zach Snyder is a genius. I love 300. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> The worst. Horrible movie. Every if Zack Snyder ever does a movie in which there isn't some slow down, speed up, slow down, speed up junk, I swear I I will uh, I'll I'll, I'll resign. <laughs> resign I from will. what? I don't know something. I'll resign from something. <laughs> anyway, we're not uh, here to talk about movies. I know. We're to talk about DVDs. Yes, we are. So uh, you know what? It's a week that's light on television, but heavy on new movies and junk and stuff. And we got a bunch of criterions that I'm going to start out with. You, you always criticize me for starting off with the stuff that no one cares about. So you know what? I'm going to start with criterion. Yeah, but you're not going to give me any of them. I don't think you really want any of these. These aren't your kinds of criterions. I love ye. Do you love I ye? Do. do you really? I do. Seriously? A, a one and a two. I do. And the director just died a couple I, years ago. I know. You know, I interviewed him. That's, I what, interview- that's I, what killed him. Exactly. No, I interviewed him around the time of the release. I I saw Yee Yee at Cannes. It was like 1992, I think. I know I'm dating myself. And uh, it's a lovely film. And then um, it was released in the U.S. about a year, maybe a year and a half later, maybe two years later. But I interviewed him. You know where I interviewed him? Uh, I interviewed- the men's room of a... No. No. I interviewed him literally like close to your place. I interviewed him at the... Um, the uh, what you may call it drive through Larry's Schmelly's Schmeckies Goobies In and Out. No, the place it's yeah, there's one in Hollywood on Sunset. The what is it? What uh, are you talking about? I mean, it's like an old old style di- Mel's Diner. Oh, Mel's Diner. Yeah, I interviewed him at Mel's in the Valley. Yeah, he, Mel's. Made, he made a great film. His sister his sister lived here. Anyway, yeah, no, he did. So Ye is a terrific film, and it's on Blu-ray, courtesy of Criterion, and we love them. Um, it is, uh, Mark, how would you describe the plot of Yee Yee? What, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? What, what were you doing with your cell phone? Oh, I'm using it as a bit of a flashlight. Is, 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 is this room not, uh... Sufficiently bright? Sufficiently bright? No, it's sufficiently bright. So, um, how would you describe Yee Yee? You know, it's hard to describe, actually. Um, it, I guess it's about... Because it's a long-ass movie. It's a long movie. It's three hours. It's about a family that the, the, the wife is in the spiritual crisis and the, and the father's got these business partners and they're making a lot of bad decisions and the teenage daughter. A family drama. We could call it a family it's drama. It's a family drama. It's a Taiwanese family drama. Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, yes. Uh, a one and a two is, as Mark said, the, the American title. And uh, this is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous transfer of a film that is really not designed to be all that visually spectacular. 
mind you, it's three hours long. It's a three hour long family drama set in Taiwan. But um, Edward Yang was able to do a, an audio commentary for the previous release, so you get that here uh, on the Blu ray. And uh, he is joined by uh, Tony Raines, who's a, really a terrific uh, scholar on Asian cinema. And uh, there's also a video interview with Reigns and a uh, little, little thing about the new Taiwan cinema movement, which actually was a lot more relevant when they originally did this, but it's not that... Uh, it's kind of faded, to be honest. Taiwanese film has sort of gone into hibernation. It really has, actually, hasn't yeah, it? It's, it's been replaced sad. by like the, the uh, Romanian New Wave or something. Yeah, it has. That's so sort of those crap. things have a, have a short shelf life. Sometimes. But you know what? It's a, it's a beautiful-looking transfer. It was a, it's, a, it's a 4K transfer. And it, it's, it's good-looking. It's great. And they cleaned it up. Like Criterion always does. And here's, here's, here's my favorite of the week. This is our, far and away, as long as we're on kind of a Criterion foreign film binge, Au Revoir Les Enfants, Louis oh, Malle. Oh, it's one of Wade's favorites. You know, 1987 was an amazing year. It really was. That was like the last great movie year as far as I'm concerned. Do you know why? Uh, au Revoir Les Enfants. No, not just Au Revoir Les Enfants. It was, this was the year. There were four films this year. Four films, I remember this. Four amazing films that dealt with uh, basically childhood and war. And Empire of the Sun. And World War II. Now, the only one that didn't quite have, it wasn't childhood during World War II, it was sort of childhood and war and then World War II. I'm going to name them. Go ahead, name them. Um, Full Metal Jacket. No. That was 87. I was 87, but it's not about childhood and war. Oh. It's just well, it's war. About war. It's about war. But oh, it's, it's a great oh, film. Okay, hang on, you ready? Yeah. Hope and Glory. Yes. Oh, Hope and Glory. Which we love. Yes. Uh, Last Emperor. Yes. Uh, Lethal Weapon. No. <laughs> or Warlays on Fall, obviously, because we're or talking Warlays about. There's on one Fall. more. There's one more. Uh, let me see. Uh, Cadillac of the Skies. Broadcast News. <laughs> Empire of the Sun. I said Empire of the Sun. I know before. you did. I know. I was waiting for you to say it again. Well, hang on. Wait. I hang was... on. There's one more. What is that? Empire of the Sun. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> You are a mensch. Great films. No, that, that was a, an amazing. Was an amazing year, right? Empire of the Sun, starring a very young. Yeah, Incre- Bale. incredible year. Christian Bale, very young. That's right. Christian Bale. That was his first uh, big schmingy. And you know what? He's great in it. He's terrific in it. Yeah. You know, Spielberg doesn't make me. You know, Empire of the Sun, and Close Encounters. Where's that Spielberg? I know. That's what I'm. I want that guy back. Well, anyway, Au revoir les enfants is, of course, uh, director Louis Malle. Louis Malle, who was married to Candace Bergen for many years, one of the great pioneers of the French New Wave, who was technically not part of the New Wave. Kind of interesting. Uh, but Louis Malle, an amazing filmmaker, went back to France after many years in Hollywood and made a film basically uh, about his childhood, based in his experiences during World War II uh, in, a, uh, in a school during Nazi occupation, uh, it is just a touching, powerful, incredible movie, and the performances of these kids are unbelievable. I mean, if you want to see the genius of Louis Mal, it is in how he gets these performances out of these kids. It is just dazzling. It is extraordinary. Uh, all kinds of great stuff in the extras here. Uh, this, of course, is the um, the official incredible transfer. Now, you know, not a gr- not great audio here, but the um, uh, the cinematographer Renato. Uh, Berta did the uh, oversaw this transfer, and it's fantastic. You get interviews with Louis Malle. Uh, there's even I mean, this is an interesting little tidbit on here. They include the um, 1917 uh, Charlie Chaplin interview, uh, the immigrant. Do you know why? Because because uh, it's used in the film. It's used in the film. Yeah. And then there's a gr- there's a, a there are audio excerpts from an uh, AFI interview with Louis Mall, which is kind of weird. I don't know why they didn't videotape that, but. Um, you get the original trailer and teaser, and it's just, it's wonderful. It's just, but get it for the movie. It's Blu ray, it's gorgeous, it's spectacular. Um, then we also have the documentary, The Times of Harvey Milk, which um, kind of, in a way, I would say inspired the making of the film Milk that Sean Penn won Best Actor for a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, this this is, is much better. Well, this is way better. I mean, because the story is, it, it, it merits a documentary more than it does anything else. Uh, 1984. And uh, very, very well made. Uh, kind of a, it's not even really a, necessarily a tribute to Harvey Milk. It's almost in many respects not even really about Harvey Milk. It's about everything that he represented, the gay rights movement of the time uh, in, in the 1970s in the Bay Area. It's really a fascinating film. 
uh, quite a history lesson and uh, a lot of amazing archival footage in here that just, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not familiar with this place and time, uh, it, it's really crucial. And the sad thing is, is that, you know, did Harvey Milk really have to die for people to pay attention to these issues and this place and this time and this period in history? Seems like people don't pay attention to those nuggets of history unless somebody dies. That's, you can say that about a lot of things. Martin Luther yeah. King. Sure. Yeah. Harvey Milk. Well, anyway. Jesus. True. Very true. <laughs> That's interesting. I'll have to give that some thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, lots of extras here. Jerry Brown's in this thing? D- yeah. N- uh, once in future governor of California. Yeah, isn't that Jimmy Carter's in it. It's, it's, it was it was narrated by Harvey Firestein. Yes. Harvey Fi- Harvey Milk was a man who was amazing. I you know, I uh, I really love Harvey Firestein in um, Garbo Talks. I know that's an obscure reference, but I love Garbo Talk. No, you love Harvey Firestein from Independence Day. Yeah, that's what I love. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, there's also a, uh, a new little tidbit in here, The Times of Harvey Milk uh, and Gus Van Sant's Milk, uh, which includes, you know, all kinds of uh, little tidbits that sort of plug the uh, the movie. I don't know if that's essential, but uh, anyway, really, really great stuff. Just uh, don't miss that. And then the last of our uh, couple of criterions, this I found to be a really interesting, from a marketing standpoint, that they're doing this. They're releasing um, Topsy Turvy, the Mike Lee film, which is not my favorite Mike Lee film. It's quite. A, it's actually a bit of a departure from Mike it's Lee. It's a real departure. You know, this is uh, his kind of semi-biopic about Gilbert and Sullivan, and it's a much more, like, scripted, story-centric, straightforward, period thing. It's not one of those actor's workshop deals that he usually does. And he, But he earned an Oscar nomination for that. I know he did. I know he did. But they're releasing Topsy Turvy on Blu-ray along with... Uh, Oddly enough, a Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, a film taken from a Gilbert and Sullivan opera or operetta, The Mikado. Holy Christ. Isn't that weird? No. It's so weird. When you say weird, you mean like UFO weird or just weird in a... I just mean weird in like a strange, incomprehensible way. Uh, <laughs> here's what I can't believe. Do you, you, you know how long it's been since Topsy Turvy? Uh, 1992. Oh, come on. 89. 99. 99. Yeah. Oh. But that's over 10 years. I know. I can't believe it. Please stop. Topsy Turvy feels like four years ago. Please stop. I know. It's terrible, right? Please stop. Horrible. Uh, Topsy Turvy looks gorgeous. Got audio commentary with Mike Lee, which is excellent. Mike Lee is just, he's such a lovable, articulate old crank. I love him. And uh, you also get his 1992 short film, A Sense of History, which featured Jim Broadbent, who, of course, is one of the stars of, uh, of the movie. And some deleted scenes and a few other little tidbits. Nothing, nothing really spectacular, but good stuff all around. I'm not a huge fan of the movie, but if you are, you got to check it out. And then the Mikado was made in 1939. I had never even heard of this before. I was completely unaware of this, but uh, bravo to Criterion for digging it up. Um, this was the uh, w- this Gilbert and Sullivan troupe called the Doily Cart or Opera Company. Um, actually was somehow recruited to make a Technicolor version of the Mikado, and uh, it ain't bad. You, you know, know why I've heard of the Dorley Cart Opera Company? Why have you heard of them? Uh, because they mentioned it on an episode of Family Guy, which you should love, but you don't. Really? Yes. Doily Cart? They, well, I've never even heard of them. They, it was obviously a, you know, yeah. a total... Joke. Well, anyway, well, the, the the most interesting thing of the extras on here, most of this stuff is not that uh, that fabulous. There's like a 1939 radio broadcast of some stuff, and um, but there's a short a short film here, a silent film, promoting their 1926 stage production of the Mikado. So it's really interesting that suddenly 13 years later they actually do the movie of it. And uh, if you watch, uh, you know, the Mikado and you watch uh, Topsy Turvy, you'll, I guess you'll gain an appreciation for Gilbert and Sullivan. I, I don't have a, a huge appreciation. But and the Doily Cart Opera Company. Whatever. Whatever. It is what it is, right? It is what it is. Yes, it is. Speaking of things that are what they are. <laughs> Maureen Killer Instinct. This I is love, on Blu-ray. I love this movie. This is part one, but though. This is part one. I, yeah. You know what? I really wish they would have just boxed them up. Come on, Wade. Box them up. Put, put part one and two on the same Blu-ray. Do I it. Know. Get it done. I know. Well, part two has already arrived. I just got it this week. Oh, good. Yeah. I haven't, haven't gotten around to taking a look at it. I mean, I've seen the movie, obviously, but checking out the Blu-ray, I haven't looked at well, it. Well, Vincent Cassell is just terrific as, uh, as Jacques Mayrine, who's one of the uh, one of the most notorious... Uh, legendary. Legendary, you know... He robbed banks. He broke out of prison. He kidnapped people, and it's just just totally 
flamboyant presentation. Fabulous, fabulous celebrity gangster in the history of France. Now, it's funny because th- this movie came out around the same time as Carlos. Yeah. Which is a totally different take on that sort well, of a guy. This was originally, you, you know the story with Marine. Marine was made it, it several was years thing. ago. Well, well, it was it was originally, I saw this at Colcoa like two, oh, three years ago. Don't show off with the blah, uh, blah. No. Oh, by the way, tomorrow night, uh, the, this year's Colcoa lineup gets announced. Dud. And uh, I will be moderating an event this year, as I do every year. <laughs> And it's pretty spectacular this year. It is. <laughs> I am. Go- I'm moderating an evening with Bertrand Blier for crying out loud. What? Bertrand, Bertrand Blier is coming to the U.S. What well, Bertrand Blier? Yeah. How exciting is that? Uh, who's that? Oh my gosh! Look up his credits. I'm going to do B- it right now. B L I E R. I'm going to do that right now. Do it. Do it. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. Marine is is great on Blu-ray. This thing is just epic. It's you know the two films, four hours, and uh, Marine is a, is a fascinating figure because he just got so full of himself, and eventually it was all about the fame, not about the money. Fascinating. That that that's where his story has resonance today. Yeah, uh, and that's why. And you know what? It's uh, it's just you know what? It's two parts, but you don't really feel it. Yeah. Of course, Carlos was three parts. Yeah. But you don't feel you it. You don't feel that either, either actually. Because they're such fascinating figures. It's true. Totally yeah, true. Absolutely. So uh, check out uh, Marine Part 1, Killer, Inst- uh, Killer Instinct. You gotta and, love it. And meanwhile, uh, before you you know get on to Marine Part 2, you might want to check out Tony Ja in Ong Bak 3, The Final Battle. Now, we've talked about this before, that Ong Bak 2 and Ong Bak 1 have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And even though Tony Ja has tried to say create some kind of spiritual explanation for why a movie about a guy trying to recover a Buddhist head in contemporary times has something to do with a medieval story about a Thai fighter who grows up as an orphan and is raised by bandits. The two movies have nothing to do with each other. But uh, Ong Bak 3 is a sequel to Ong Bak 2, so it actually makes it kind of a, you know, it should this should be 2 and Ong Bak 2 should be something 1. Uh, but this, is a, this continues the story that ended in... Um, uh, with uh, at the end of Ong Bak Two, rather kind of a cliffhanger, and it's uh, it's equally impressive, incredibly violent, and this time Tony Ja got himself a little bit of help in directing it with uh, his old buddy Pana Ritikrai, who had to take over for him on the second film when he uh, took over his went off on his little pilgrimage into the mountains and left the uh, the production stranded but uh, the action is fabulous photography is incredible and they probably made it for 18 cents because in thailand you can make movies for next to no money uh this is uh, absolutely fantastic it's a beautiful blu-ray it's also out on dvd they did not send us the dvd they only sent us the blu-ray and i would say just don't even bother with anything else the blu-ray rocks but this is an unbelievably violent movie uh, but since Hong Kong movies have mostly gone to hell, I would say stick with uh, Tony Jaa and the Ong Bak movies. Thailand is now making what Hong Kong used to. Rock on. Rock on. Rock on. Wait. Uh, let me try that again. Wade. Puberty. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nasty thing when it hits. It's, I got to it, tell it, you. It's like that episode of The Brady Bunch. It is. When it's time to change, it's time <laughs> uh-huh. to rearrange. Uh, Remember that? Uh, yeah, vaguely. <laughs> that was the song. I know. When it's time. I'll sing it again. Uh, Wade, you know who I don't like? Who don't you like, Mark? Dario Argento. <sighs> He's the worst. He is the uh, the he is synonymous with Italian uh, giallo horror films. Which we, are, I, 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 I don't like him either. Which are low budget, and they all star James Franciscus, except for Inferno, which is from 1980. Now, this is a uh, kind of a sequel to Suspiria, another Dario Argento film I don't like. And uh, this one uh, involves an American college student, and uh, he's hanging out in Rome, and his sister is uh, in New York, and they're investigating these killings. And um, the place is where these killings take place. The place is where these killings take place, if I may say places in twice in the same sentence. Yes. Is the place where witches live. Boo. Yeah, Boo is right. Boo, move on. Uh, what's on this thing? Uh, interview with uh, one of the stars, Lee McCluskey. Interview with uh, Dario Argento, who's still around. I know, as as is his daughter. Unfortunately, both of them. His I daughter wish both makes go away. dreadful, horrible movies, and is a dreadful horror. She, her daughter, his daughter is like the Courtney Love of uh, film, <laughs> just a train wreck, a total train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> the, wow, I never thought of it that way, but you're you're kind of right. 
Wow. Anyway, Inferno's lame. Oh, man, awful. Okay, Mark, I'm going to talk about one film, and then you're going to talk about another, and we're going to try to figure out what these two movies have to do with each other. Um, you know I've what? Got... I like the one in your hand more than I like the one in my hand, actually. Well, that's interesting. I have a documentary here. Oh, that's not the one. Well, this, this is, ba- this is a, a, a documentary called Afterlife. And uh, it's directed by Paul Perry, who is something of an author that I've never heard of. Presumably he's important. And um, this features a lot of experts and a lot of people that don't really know what they're talking about, all kind of pontificating about something that we cannot prove. Of course, we'd all love to believe that such a thing exists, but there, it's about the afterlife, as you might guess by the fact that the title of the film is Afterlife. Uh, I, I'm always a little bit annoyed by this because it's, it's sort of like it, – this is like making a documentary um, uh, about, you know – Yes? That's what I'm saying. This is like making a documentary about – Nothingness? Nothingness. About what happens afterwards. About, y- After y- life. Y- yeah, but, you know, it's just, all it is is speculation. I mean, it's nice to speculate, but there's the why go and interview PhDs and MDs and all these guys? What's the point? I like the movie that you have better. You, you know, you know. I remember when which we, is we, we saw. Uh, well, we saw this film at the same time. We uh, did. I was. Uh, you were sitting like you know twenty rows up from me, mm-hmm. and when it was over, I walked up because I saw you in the up there. I walked up and I said, I said that didn't work for me, and you loved it. It has not lingered with me, as I hoped it might, but I still really, I, I enjoy parts of it. I really, really, I was very touched by it. And we're talking, of course, about Hereafter. And, you know, Hereafter got a lot of love from some of the major critics like uh, Roger Ebert and A.O. Scott and Kenneth Turan. And you know why? Because it's Clint Eastwood and that guy could just crap out uh, the story of a, a guy who makes toast and they'll love it. And the thing is that... You know, for a guy like Eastwood, who is at this point in, I think he's in his early 90s. I, I'm not really, I kind of I kind of <laughs> lost track. Um, you would think that he would have more insight into this sort of a subject, which is basically about what happens uh, after you die. But somehow this just this, this thing is just seems like kind of an unfocused mess of a movie. Uh, Matt Damon plays a uh, this he plays a guy who has this. Can see the dead, speak to the dead. He, he's kind I don't of a know medium. What he does. He's kind of a medium. He holds your hand and then he can talk to your loved ones. Just like every other stupid movie about a guy or a lady who are, or, or some old witch who can. Sure. Who, who, it's just it's lame. Yeah. You yeah. realize that if this was directed by anybody else, everyone would hate it. Maybe. But it's also very well done. You know, here's the interesting thing about Hereafter. Did you know that this was playing all over Japan and they, they pulled it because of the tsunami? Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the irony of that. Imagine if you had just seen this. If you were watching it the day of, imagine you're watching this and the tsunami scene happens and then you walk out and suddenly you get hit by a tsunami. Ugh. I mean, that, the, the horror of that is just, I can't, you know. So, so bravo to Warner for having the good taste to, to say we've got to yank, the, yank that from those screens. Can I, can I just call something out? Yeah, call it out. Now, I happen to know that, and actually I called it up because I, I can't okay. believe he said this. Yeah. Peter oh, Travers. Oh, I, he, he, oh, Peter, Peter Travers. Travers. No, that's, I'm not. I'm not talking about the guy you think I'm talking about. Okay, Peter Travers from the from Rolling Stone, longtime yeah. critic from Rolling Stone. Yeah, this is his quote: "Hereafter, set to a resonant Clint Eastwood score." Oh, jeez, truly is haunting. Oh my now, gosh! Now, Clint Eastwood has earned the right to score his own films. Yes, he has. He's the worst composer in Hollywood. <laughs> He's terrible. He is terrible. Every score, and he, always, and he always hires his son to play them on the piano. Oh, and uh, Kyle. That, uh, Kyle Eastwood, who I, I, well, Kyle Eastwood used to get billing himself. Yes, he did. And somehow he edged, father it's edged out just, the son. It's just it, it, it's the same the, slow the, plinking bling, piano thing. Plinky pling, <laughs> plinky pling. <laughs> Plinky plane. And it's like not anything. It just no, some it's not random even a score. It's just music. it doesn't it doesn't feel like it goes with anything. It just it feels like you're watching a movie and someone <laughs> in the corner of the theater is just playing the <laughs> piano just randomly for some reason. And it, it's annoying. It's just as annoying as if that were really happening. As if you, you you keep wanting to turn around and go, Would you stop playing the piano? I'm trying to watch the movie. <laughs> Unfortunately, the guy playing the piano is this it's in the score of the film. Uh, we have another couple of interesting releases, kind of documentary uh, feature things here. Warner Brothers did this intentionally. They have released Charlton Heston Presents The Bible. 
Now, the reason Charlton Heston presents the Bible and not God is because Charlton Heston, well, effectively, has, you know, he's been Ben-Hur, he's been John the Baptist, he's been uh, Moses. He sort of earned the right to be the go-to Bible guy. Uh, this is a uh, four-episode series, Genesis, the story of Moses, Jesus of Nazareth, and the Passion. And uh, this is obviously very, very intentionally being released in time for both Passover and Easter. And uh, it's actually quite good. Uh, not brilliant, not the most incredibly scholarly thing I've ever seen, but it's about four hours worth. Each one of these is about an hour. And uh, Charlton Heston basically just takes you to a lot of uh, Middle Eastern locales and goes through a lot of the historiography and the archaeology and the, and the theology, and it's actually quite interesting. Uh, very nicely done. And then uh, Warner Brothers, to make sure that they didn't leave any stone in their library unturned, they are also, also releasing King of Kings, which is one of the lesser-known Jesus movies of the period. Most people pay more attention to uh, The Greatest Story Ever Told, starring Max von Sydow. This stars, Mark, Jeffrey Hunter. Oh, Jeffrey Hunter. Captain Christopher Pike doing Jesus. The, That's right. As far as I'm concerned, the original Captain, Captain Kirk. Of the, yes, pretty much. I mean, really, he, he, he would have been. He would have been. It would have been he Captain been. Pike. There would be no Captain Kirk. I yeah, know. There and, would, there, uh, there'd be no Bone Spock. <laughs> there would just be a really intelligent, good-looking, square-jawed guy. But he, uh, he once played Jesus. In this film directed by Nicholas Ray, who, of course, had also done... Um, Rebel Without Rebel a Cause. Rebel Without a Cause, which is why a lot of people nicknamed this derogatorily, I am a teenage Jesus, or I was a teenage Jesus. <laughs> uh, not very nice, is it? Awesome. No, not nice at all. But anyway, it, it's actually a, quite a good film produced by Samuel Bronston, one of the big uh, producers of the day. And uh, I, I think the film's perfectly good. It's, uh, you know, it's not brilliant, but it's... It's it's got a great Nicholas Rosa score. You know, Rosa also did uh, Ben Hur. It's a it's a it's a good film, and it deserve it's a blue. This is Blu-ray. We should point out, and it's a widescreen film, very colorful, transfers beautifully to Blu-ray. So I don't have a problem with Warner Brothers kind of being a little bit whorish about you know trying to pump this stuff out with the with the big Easter trying to ride on, ride the Easter wave. As long uh, as they don't rush out the transfer, that's the no, most important no, no. part. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, a little foreign film here that I'm very excited about. Jacques Rivette. We were talking earlier about Louis Malle. Jacques Rivette is one of the original French New Wave guys, and uh, he's really kind of the last one who's just continually making lots of movies. He, can, he makes them over the routinely, and he's like 90 years old now or something. He made this beautiful movie uh, last year called Around a Small Mountain. It's a beautiful film with Jane Birkin and Sergio Castellito. Now, Sergio Castellito, everybody knows he's a very good Italian actor-director. Uh, Jane Birkin is the uh, the English actress who was once married to Serge Gainsbourg, and uh, that produced Charlotte Gainsbourg, who has all of her parents' skills and then some. But this is just a lovely film, and really, you know what this movie's about? It's about a guy who goes around a small mountain. Exactly. This literally is a metaphor for stop and take the time to smell the roses. Don't let life pass you by. That's all it is. He's on a business trip. He meets this woman. She's uh, she kind of has this connection to this uh, traveling circus in this small town. So he literally stops his business trip, and uh, just he's so he's so enamored of this woman, and he gets involved in the in all of her kind of private life affairs and all these matters in her life and this circus, and it just it, it's just lovely. It's a sweet little eighty four minute movie, and it is so so touching and uh cinema guild is releasing this and you gotta get this it's only on dvd not on blu-ray but you gotta see it it's just such a sweet gentle film you don't see much of this anymore and you know what sergio uh castellito is kind of one of my favorite italian actors he was in uh, my mother's smile and mostly martha oh uh, he's, he's fabulous he's, yeah, he's, oh, he's so good mostly martha yeah and you know he was entirely dubbed in that movie did you know that in german is that right? It is like one of the most meticulous dubbing jobs ever. The, the film's director, I actually interviewed her about that. I couldn't believe it when she told me that. Blew my freaking mind. Blew my mind. Wade. Yeah. There's a movie. And there were a lot of movies. We've <laughs> talked about some of them today. Uh, when you and I walked into Tangled on a Saturday morning at oh, the uh, Tangled. at the uh, El Capitan Theater. And by the way, I don't like the El... Here's the thing with the El Capitan Theater. Huh. The El Capitan Theater yeah. is in uh, is on Hollywood Boulevard. Yes, right across from the Kodak Theater where they have the Oscars. Yes, Hollywood and Highland, the big, yes. uh, the worst mall in America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, the El Capitan is uh, kind of a Disney owned theater. Yeah, and it's where they have all the Disney uh, screenings. Sure. Now, before they start the Disney, before they start the screening, yeah, they have a guy, yeah, who sits in front of the stage, yes. and plays the Calliope. Yes, naked. Naked. 
Not naked. No, no, not naked. He plays a calliope. Yes. Someone needs to shoot him. <laughs> he needs to stop. You don't, First li- of you all, don't like him? No. First of all, the calliope, it's too loud. Why? Because it's too loud. I can't talk to anybody. No. I mean, it is so loud that's, that I can't talk true. to the person next to you when that's you're sort of true. kind of discussing the movie or whatever. That, yeah. Or discussing why the hell you're there trying to see Tangled at yeah. 8 in the morning when you'd rather be sleeping. Yeah. But Tangled is pretty great. So we went to Tangled, and we expected nothing, didn't we? Uh, uh, not we much. We expected nothing. No, because the not commercials much. were horrible. And you know what? It's, it's quite good. It's really fun. It's good. It's great. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, Alan Menken uh, music is terrific. Songs are fun. Animation is terrific. It feels more cell animated than CGI animated, which is nice. I, I, a little bit like Ratatouille and, uh, and The Incredibles. You know, it feels more like a an old-fashioned animated movie, and I just think it's delightful. Yep, I, think I it's agree. Fabulous. Yeah. It's uh, based on the story of Rapunzel. And, uh, Originally titled Rapunzel, but they changed the title because they didn't. The, the tracking with teenage boys didn't show interest in a movie titled Rapunzel. And you know what? It did better because of it. You think? Yeah, why not? Uh, if you're 13 years old and you want to go see Rapunzel, you know what the old kid's going to say? It's just you look at the history of Disney movies. Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty. Yes, every one of those films came about 30 years before Jaws and Star Wars, which changed see, everything. That, and I, I rue the day. I rue the day that George Lucas contaminated and putrefied the youth of America. <laughs> it's just a horrible, horrible disaster. Anyway, Tangled, uh, it's a beautiful uh, transfer, as you would imagine, on yep. Blu-ray, and the DVD is included also. And uh, even better than that, the film is just terrific. Not much by way of extras. Uh, just a little featurette and some deleted scenes, but um, yeah, it's just so much fun. Really, really good. Really good. Gosh, I love this movie. I got, I'm going to watch that again. You know, uh, Christy has not seen it. It's a good, good excuse, right? Absolutely. Well, she doesn't. She's, she, she sees and doesn't see weird movies. You know, there's another movie that came out that was animated yes. that was also in 3D. I love this movie. This is a great movie. This is, this is one of the best films I saw last this, year. This, this actually – stop. stop. You're, you're, you're being silly. Um, this actually is available in Blu-ray 3D or just regular Blu-ray. And I, I have actually seen both – I've seen a, enough of it both in uh, regular Blu-ray and 3D Blu-ray to be able to tell you beyond any shadow of a doubt – that both of them deserve to be ground up and um, cast off into space, where their dust will be scattered so that it cannot contaminate future generations. Yogi Bear, or this movie that they uh, disgustingly, shamefully called Yogi Bear, which has so little to do with the original Yogi Bear, the original Hanna-Barbera animated cartoon that I grew up on, this is just the dumbest thing I have ever seen in my entire life. This is a horrible, horrible film. (laughs) <laughs> There's nothing redeeming about it. It is an absolute and total screaming embarrassment. It's dreadful. <laughs> and I have to tell you about that about that YouTube video, the uh, the alternate <laughs> with, with the with uh, the assassination the, the, the Jesse James, James ending. <laughs> okay, if if if, if you haven't great. seen this, you got to Google you Google Yogi Bear and the assassination of Jesse James. There is a guy out there. I don't know who it was. Yeah, he created. An alternate ending for the movie. He's just some guy, had not, yeah. not affiliated with the studio, not affiliated with the movie, created an alternate True. ending based on the assassination of Jesse James by the coward oh Robert gosh. Ford, and it is absolutely hilarious. It, it's really <laughs> funny. The song at the end. It's really funny. Oh, but the, here's, here's the what best. I hate about the movie, and I'll spend, I'll waste no more time on it. But honestly, it's it's as if somebody looked at the Yogi Bear cartoons, the original ones, and said. You know what? Kids back then were a lot smarter than kids today. I think we have to really dumb this down. Look, I still enjoy those original Yogi Bear cartoons, but they're pretty juvenile. Do you really, honestly, did we have to make it even more juvenile? Oh, jeez. Yes, people, because Wade, somewhere there's a seven-year-old boy who doesn't want to see because it's too smart. People who run these studios, they just need to be shot, all of them. What? Lined up against a wall and just machine gunned to death. Spare us all the bad movies. What else we got there? Oh, speaking of bad movies, how about uh, the end of James L. Brooks's career? Oh, my gosh. How do you know? Is uh, j- is a misbegotten, horrible misfire of a James L. Brooks it's film? It's incredible to think that the man who made broadcast news made this. Oh, I it's love dreadful. broadcast news. Uh, Reese Witherspoon, Owen Wilson, Paul Rudd, Jack Nicholson. Um, oh, James L. Brooks. You know, Reese Witherspoon plays a professional softball player uh, who begins a fling with a professional baseball player. And if then at the same time, he meets a, uh, a businessman facing legal action, played by Paul Rudd, whose father's Jack Nicholson. And this is just, 
it is just forced and labored and not funny and not focused. And I don't care about a professional softball player. I don't know why that is even considered any sort of a career that is worth documenting on film. Uh, Blu-ray exclusives include 19 minutes of uh, deleted scenes, conversation with Hans Zimmer, and uh, there you go. It's just so bad. It's just one of those pop, brightly lit James L. Brooks films that you never thought he would make. You just never thought he'd make a film this bad. Yeah, it's it is truly, truly bad. Um, I have to say, also, I was disappointed in Fair Game. Fair Game is the uh, Naomi Watts, Sean Penn film all about the Valerie Plame scandal. Uh, what I didn't like about this film, actually, what I liked about the film, actually, I didn't like much about the film, <laughs> I have to say. I, uh, I, I didn't see it. No. I, yeah, I didn't get around to seeing it. I, I, you, you told me all the bad stuff, and I just said I can't. Well, I, Watts I can't. plays a Valerie Plame, who, of course, is the uh, CIA officer who was outed yeah. uh, in the media. Yeah. And uh, where uh, the movie starts, like, the, the, the problem with the movie is that it wants to be, it's trying to be, and really shouldn't be, a yeah. thriller. Uh. And mixed in with the thriller elements is this family drama about how it affects Boo. the family when Valerie Boo. Plame gets outed. The issue is that the movie shouldn't be a thriller. It's it, you, you don't you don't need you know, uh, director um, Doug Lyman who did Swingers and Go. He doesn't need to pump up the thrill well, factor. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Smith was the one where he kind of decided I'm going to be Mr. Johnny Action filmmaker. Yeah, he doesn't need to. And do then that. he did the Born Identity and, and yeah, all that stuff. That, that's not what this movie should be. Yeah. And then the the, the marital he still stuff, has all that stuff going on. He still wants to be that guy. It, it, but this is not the right movie to be that I guy. Know, and then I the know. marital stuff winds up being kind of banal, and and that's where maybe there'd be some meat. Yeah. But in the end, it just wasn't very good. Uh, special features, audio commentary. Interesting audio commentary, by the way. The only reason to uh, check out this Blu-ray. Audio commentary with Valerie Plame and her husband, Joe Wilson. Interesting. Which is kind of interesting. Otherwise, you can pass on fair game. Very interesting Blu-ray here from Wolf Video. Um, it's called A Marine Story. Now, this is not one of those uh, big gung-ho things with some muscle-bound ex-WWE uh, wrestler or something. This is a movie about a uh, a woman, a decorated uh, marine who has to coach a troubled young woman to get through all of her legal problems and kind of you know do her duty in the military. Um, <laughs> do her duty. Yeah, do her duty. But here's what's uh, here's what's interesting about this. Um, this film comes from Wolf Video, which is primarily a gay video house, and uh, so that kind of will cue a lot of people as to what the the theme of the movie is, but it, it feels initially like this might be kind of a recruitment video, but it's not. It's actually a very interesting, very well-written film, and uh, despite the, all of the, uh, you know, the various stuff around the edges, it's not really a message movie either way. I just thought it was, a, it was an interesting story, well told, a very interesting uh, dilemma, and unfortunately it doesn't, you know, it's, it fits in that slot where it's hard to get theatrical distribution. But a um, good commentary from writer-director uh, Ned Farr, and a few other little things, deleted scenes and uh, featurette stuff, uh, nothing that's all that, that dazzling. But it's actually a very, very good Blu-ray transfer, and I would say a worthwhile rental for sure, even on Blu-ray. And then one of my favorite films of the year, totally unheralded, uh, but you've got to check this out. This is a wonderful film. Mark, I don't know if you saw this, Made in Dagenham. Did you see I, Made in Dagenham? I did see it. I, oh, I, I thought it was movie. fine. You liked it a lot more than I did. I love this movie. Well, Sally Hawkins, you know, you got to remember, Sally Hawkins starred in Mike Lee's Happy Go Lucky, and she won me over. I, I didn't remember her from anything previous because that was the most central I'd ever seen her in a film. I hated Poppy for the first hour of that movie. I wanted to shoot her in the head. I wanted to strangle her. I wanted her to suffer the most horrible, gory death of any movie character ever. I was almost ready to walk out of that movie. And then, you know what? This is why you don't walk out of movies. There's a turning point in Happy Go Lucky where Mike Lee just flips the tables and suddenly I fell in love with her and I have loved her as an actress ever since. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I truly, I, wi I was wishing the most horrible, painful death on her for 60 minutes and now I, I just can't get enough of her in the movies. Well, the thing with Happy-Go-Lucky, Happy now that we're talking about that film, is that you expect the character of Poppy to stop being so... Aggressively irritating. Aggressively, irritatingly positive about yeah. everything and happy to like maybe do someone something horrible happen. Really not. She's no. that's just her outlook on life. She she's Poppy. She's Poppy. Yeah. Well, anyway, in here, uh, Sally Hawkins stars in the true story of an amazing event that took place in 1968, where the women who were a small minority of the Ford plant in uh, in England 
who really all they did was just stitch the uh, the upholstery. But they decided that they weren't getting their fair share. They weren't getting what the men were getting, and they went on strike and basically shut the whole factory down. And uh, it's an amazing moment in labor relations in the U.K. It really is. It's a fascinating piece of history. Bob Hoskins is unbelievable in this. Sally Hawkins, phenomenal. Um, it's just it, it's a really, really good, solid film, beautifully, beautifully directed by Nigel Cole, who previously did Calendar Girls, which is a little bit kind of the same thing. Yes, it's got it that, that female full Monty vibe going. But, gosh, this is a great film. See it on Blu-ray. It's so beautifully shot. And... Um, it's just it's well written. I don't know why this didn't get better love kind of at Oscar time. It got nothing. It got nothing. Because it's just formulaic. That's why. I know, but it's so it's so lovely. <laughs> it is. It's a fun film. You it's know, a beautiful it, it's, film. It's a, it's, a, it's it's a very empowering female story and an important story for the time. Nigel Cole commentary. Good good commentary by the way. He gives good commentary. That guy. Mark, uh, we we've been doing these commentaries for Vanguard. And uh, we've been enjoying them, haven't we? We have. We uh, did one for this film called Becoming Eduardo. And uh, it's one of the better ones we've done. It's, uh, it's about this kid named Eddie. He's 16 years old. He's kind of a juvenile delinquent. And he, um, he goes to this kind of this alternative high school in New Mexico. And, um, you know, he's a good kid, but he kind of starts to fall in with the wrong crowd. And then he meets this girl. And it's kind of about uh, you're, you're sort of going through the film hoping that Eduardo realizes, you know, the better life he could be leading for himself if he, would, if he would just sort of wake up, and hopefully this girl will wake him up. I think one of the points that we raised in the commentary, which is uh, totally valid, is that it starts off and you think, oh, great, another one of these hood films, another one of these movies, because it feels for a second like it is going to be one of those movies that we saw during the 80s and early 90s, and uh, everything kind of in the wake of Boys in the Hood, but it doesn't. It takes a really interesting twist and goes in a totally different direction, and I really appreciated that. Yeah, it's good. It's good stuff. Uh, also on the disc is a uh, making of slideshow, but really you just care about the. Uh, that's it. The commentary by the that's digi gods. Yeah, because you know, we're cool. Because we rule. We're just we're just cool dudes. Uh, blow through a few of the final uh, little tidbits here. We got another Gamera double feature, courtesy of the good people at Shout Factory. They have been releasing all those Godzilla movies, and once the Godzilla movies are done, you got to turn to Gamera. Why? Because Gamera's a turtle. When all said and done, Mark, Gamera's just a turtle. He's a flying yeah, turtle. He is the most terrifying turtle ever. He's a flying turtle who, who spins like a flying saucer, which has got to make him dizzy. Awesome. Never understood that. No, you just don't know how, turtle, how, how intergalactic, gigantic space turtles work, Wade. But, but see, this is what's weird to me. What's weird to me is, awesome. it, like, like, let's say you, you, you've done the Godzilla franchise. You're looking for another monster. Uh, okay, Godzilla, basically kind of a big T-Rex type thing, at least modified so we can you know, make a suit and put a guy in it. What's our next monster going to be? A turtle? Really? Seriously? Well, they have a hard no, outer shell, so they can like... I guess. The thing is whatever. that they could take the hard outer shell, they can flip themselves over, yeah. and then land on somebody and crush them with their shell. The problem if they do that is they can't get up again. Well, in this, here we have uh, two films, Gamera versus Zegra. Now, that should, that's just Zegra, not to be confused with uh, Bobby Zegra, who used to live down the street from me when I was growing up, because he wouldn't hold a candle against Gamera, unless he was you know, on one of his bad hygiene days, in which case Gamera just wouldn't mess with him at all. And then uh, the second one is Gamera the Super Monster, which sort of speaks for itself. Although I've got to tell you, even if you think you know what you're, you're, what you're in for it with Gamera the Super Monster, it is hilarious. Absolutely unintentional hilarity you can't even comprehend. Uh, Anything Goes, starring Frank Sinatra and Ethel Merman, together again, from the Archive of American Television. This is a Cole Porter musical uh, based on a book by uh, P.G. Wodehouse. P.G. Wodehouse, one of the you know, great I mean, writers of all time, really amazing writer of the last century. And uh, you know what? If you like that kind of classic television stuff, this is fine. It's, uh, Cole Porter kind of deserves better than, than black and white live television, which is what this is. But it's, it's fine. It's just uh, it's that TV thing, that golden age of television look. And a lot of people uh, probably will really vibe that. Um, this was originally part of NBC's Colgate Comedy Hour, uh, aired in 1954. And, uh, you know, uh, well, okay, fine, cool. The only reason we have this is because Ethel Merman had a personal kinescope copy of this. Otherwise, this would have been lost forever. Do you know that? I did not know that. I know. Interesting. Yeah, fascinating. 
And then lastly, uh, Andy Lau, great Hong Kong actor who's gotten better with age, actually, uh, in Battle of the Warriors, which is a big period Hong Kong Chinese battle epic. Uh, it's okay. It's it's not brilliant. There are a million movies like this. Uh, this one just has a lot of production value, but it's not the greatest script. Not the. It, it's just it's fine. It's it, only if you're really really into the genre will you appreciate it. And I'm really into the genre, and I was fine with it. Um, the thing that makes it less than great, and it's on Blu-ray, and it's a beautiful Blu-ray, gorgeous transfer. I listened to the commentary. I, I, I didn't even look. Honestly, I didn't even look in the back of the box for the commentary. I was like, oh, it's a little commentary. I know who did it. Let's throw the commentary on. And, like, it, it, honestly, 14 nanoseconds into the commentary, I went, oh, jeez, can't I get away from you? Mark, What's his name? Bay Logan. Bay Logan. Gosh, honestly. And look, well. Bay, if Bay's listening to this, I haven't talked to you for, for gosh, I haven't talked to you for about 12 years. I love you. You're great. I, I know you're, you're Mr. Hong Kong. But you know, for crying out loud, just lay off the commentaries a little bit. Every single one. Just please let someone else do them for a change. How much do you think he gets paid for those? I, I don't know. He can't, right? Yeah, he can't. I, it's just, it, but he's the guy, right? He's Mr. Hong Kong. He's the day. guy. He's the guy. So anyway, uh, television. Mark, should we dr- dive into some TV? Yes. Let's do it. Are you going to make me talk about Vegas? Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to make Vegas. you talk about Vegas because I love Vegas and I could go on forever on Vegas. But you remember Dan Tana. You remember him driving his car in, in, right into the middle of his house. By the way, you I remember went to, that. That I, was a good show. I, I went to Dan Tana's uh, the restaurant the other week. I, I once, oh, really? You were there recently. I, you know what? I went to uh, the Troubadour. It's a classic old uh, venue yeah. in... Uh, West Hollywood. Yep. I went to go see Liz Fair. Yeah. Liz Fair is one of those uh, I like know, rock and roll chicks, yeah. kind of more in the 90s. Yeah. Did a classic uh, album called Exile and Guyville. I like her stuff. I like her stuff. So I went to go. I feel Liz Fair Ex- is extraordinary, extraordinary, man. That's a great song. Is that her? Yeah. Oh, she, I think she sang that. Yeah. But, you know, but the, here's the thing, though. Lately, she's traded in all the indie stuff for this kind of transparent stab at pop music machine making. And it's really not her. But whatever. You know, the the woman has a baby and she needs to pay for a kid. Okay. Anyway, so at the Troubadour, I decide I'm going to go and uh, go to Dan Tana's before the show starts, right? Okay. Dan Tana's classic, very sure. old school Italian place mm-hmm. uh, right next to the Troubadour. I go in there. Who was eating at the bar? Dan Tana. Liz Fair. Oh, wow. Liz Look Fair and her band eat, okay. eating at the bar. And uh, Dan Tana's is uh, super cool. Has she nothing to do with Vegas. No. Just the same character name. I once I once saw. A I kind of wonder about that. Like, why would they, did did the restaurant come first or the TV show? Come I don't know. First? Vlad, I saw Vlade Divac at Dan Tana's years ago. Really? Back when he was with the Lakers. That tells you how long it's been since I was there. It also tells you how long it's been since Dan Tana's been there. Now, now look at uh, look at this guy's eyebrows. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, Bart Braverman. <laughs> it's Bart Braverman, man. Uh, yeah. This, you know what? this is he hasn't of... acted since. He hasn't had a job since. This was kind of it. Well, it was. This it was. Like it was nineteen. Well, this is like the early eighties. It came. It came on the heels of Starsky and Hutch and Beretta and uh, Hawaii Five O and Magnum PI and all that stuff. And somebody says, "You know what? We've never had a cop in Vegas. We've never had a PI in Vegas. Let's do something in Vegas because Vegas is about Vegas, baby." And so they did this show in Vegas. Uh, Robert Urich, he's great. It's terrific. Uh, second season, volume two. We talked about this a little while ago, and you know what? It's just it's a fun show. It's a really fun show, and it's from an awesome period in television history. And you got to get it. That's it. Moving on. On Blu-ray is uh, Tram, which is the uh, critically acclaimed HBO series that takes place uh, a couple months after Hurricane Katrina. Ooh. And uh, yes, the name Tram is a, a neighborhood in New Orleans, and it's all about the residents of this particular neighborhood. There's, uh, you know, there's uh, like Check chef chef guy, and there's a there's um, musicians, and just New Orleans trying to Rock rebuild roll. their lives. Yeah, David baby. Simon co-created it, and nice. it's got a great cast and. Um, it's a great show. The Blu-rays are terrific. Very well shot. Bunch of audio commentaries. Some music commentaries, which is kind of interesting. And uh, Making Of and the music of Trim, which is great. John Goodman is uh, just wonderful in this thing. And uh, you know what? David Morse is in it. We all love David Morse. Steve Zahn's in it. Steve Zahn, baby. Rock yeah, on. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's good stuff. Trim, the complete first season on Blu-ray. Of course, this comes out to coincide with season two which premieres on uh, April 24th. You know what else is out on Blu-ray? Uh, Star Wars. Mad Men. Never seen it. Season four. Never seen it. 
you know what? Mad Men is really a fun show. I, I don't think it's as brilliant as everybody else th- seems to think, but it is, it's very sharp. It captures it's, – I love the fact that it's, an, it's a television dramatic show that's period. You know, it's like Sweet Smell of Success for television, and I really like that. Um, John Hamm, really great. There's a guy who's slaved away for years and years and years and uh, finally hit it big. This is uh, 13 terrific episodes from the fourth season. Includes a, a bunch of commentaries, which are uh, okay. I don't know if this is a kind of show where you really go, gee, I think I want to listen to the commentary for that episode. It's not that big of a deal. But there's a really cool archival footage from uh, the 1964 presidential campaign. Uh, which is, you know, kind of wild because that was right after, uh, you know, that was the re-election campaign for Johnson after Kennedy's assassination and all that jazz. That was like, wow. Did yeah. Johnson win? He did, yes. And then Vietnam happened, and then he didn't and run again. He, and, and then, then Nixon, he inher- Nixon inherited the mess, and then there was Watergate, and then uh, we had, you know, Ford and Carter and inflation well, and Ford cast got lines. Us out and, in 75. and then there was, you know, Reagan and uh, Iran Contra. And next thing you know, we've got, uh, you know, Bush and Clinton and Bush and Obama, and, and there it is. There we are. There it is. There's American history over the last 45 years in a nutshell. How's that? <laughs> you like that? Was that yeah, fun? It's a happy story. Every second of it. Is that good for you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I left out a few wars in there, three or four wars, yeah. you know, a couple of them in Iraq. Well, now we have three at the same time. I know. Three, it's a ma- th- magic number, right? Oh, yeah. Deaths yeah. come in threes. Yeah. Oh, that's just celebrity death. <laughs> oh, so. Wow. We're cynical, horrible people. And uh, anyway, there's a little tidbit on here, how to succeed in business Draper style, which is, it's it's kind of a... It, you know, it's it's kind of a shameless featurette in a way, but it's it, but it is interesting. It sort of tries to connect the whole the, the shows, the world of advertising, and the show to the real world of advertising. It's all right. And then, divorce circa nineteen sixties is this uh, three part documentary, um, which uh, you know it, it, that's a little bit more less of a shameless featurette. So um, yeah, I, you know, it's Mad Men, man. It's ten eighty p Blu ray. Go for it. Get some. Uh, what you shouldn't get is the second season of Scarecrow and Mrs. King, a just a terrible show that was just one of those like heart to heart, mismatched uh, the civilian paired with the uh, super spy. Y- y- you know what it really was. This is this is there was a, it was a one two oh three. This is how it happened. Moonlighting, oh, it's wonderful, great. Moonlighting, fabulous. Uh, Remington Steel, oh, fabulous. Which both of which were created by Glenn Gordon Karen, by the way. And and then oh scarecrow missing what huh this that was the one this is that the one. was one that, that it, it felt like the knockoff it, this just this felt like it this felt was like the this, this was like what this was to those what Matt Houston was to Magnum PI <laughs> oh my God Matt Houston started that guy with the mustache yeah that, exactly yeah, yeah yeah Lee uh, Lee Lee, Hor- Lee Horsley Lee Horsley Lee Horsley, <laughs> Lee Horsley. And when that when that thing came on everyone looked at that and just said. Wow, that's a shameless knockoff of Magnum P.I. I'm looking at Blue Horsley right now. Anyway, <laughs> Scarecrow, Mrs. King, season two. This is just a, a terrible show, and that's uh, all there is to it. Yeah. Uh, there's only four seasons of the show because, unfortunately, uh, Kate Jackson got uh, breast cancer, and um, the show would eventually go downhill from there. But, uh, you know, for those who like it, uh, you're out of your mind. Yeah. Okay, uh, Nickelodeon has a show called Big Time Rush. I'm going to make this really quickly. Lee uh, really- Horsley was born in 1955. That's great. He's best known in, in the television series Nero Wolf, Matt Houston, Paradise, and the 1982 cult film The Sword and the Sorcerer. That's wonderful. Oh, okay. and he recorded the audiobook edition of Lonesome Dove. Well, that's good for him. Bravo. Oh, wait, wait. He writes Western novels. Oh, jeez. Is that what he does now? I guess. Lee Horsley. Okay. All right. Uh, look, this, this show, Big Time Rush. It's a reality show. Did he really? Lee Horsley? In 2006, did? Horsley and Marshall R. Teague traveled the world in search of exotic game on the Outdoor Life Network for the reality show Benelli's Dream Hunts. Oh, jeez. He was born in Mule Shoe, Texas. Okay, <laughs> fine. Texas. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, big Time Rush. This Mule is, Shoe, Texas. You're not letting it? me get around to Big Time Rush, are you? <laughs> Big Time Rush was this Nickelodeon show. Uh, this is season one, volume one. This is a horrible show about four guys from Minnesota who uh, they're, they're going to become music stars in Los Angeles. This is a horrible show. It has like uh, really cheesy guest appearances from people like Lorenzo Lamas and Eric Estrada who mean nothing to kids today. Um, but obviously that's, you know, it's, it's all part of the Billy Ray Cyrus, um, Hannah Montana phenomenon. 
And I really, honestly, do you want to watch a show about a bunch of guys who just want to be the next uh, Nick Jonas or, God forbid, that horrible, dreadful, even satan- evil satanic spawn thing, Justin Bieber? Yes. Yes, I do. By the way, you, did you did you see uh, the uh, the new Justin Bieber thing, the uh, downfall Justin Bieber thing? What is that? Well, that, that somebody got a downfall um, parody onto YouTube again. Oh God, I thought those were dead. I know we th- we all well they all got pulled because of the copyright thing, but someone did one where um, Hitler's flipping out about Justin Bieber's popularity. <laughs> it is hilarious. It's one of the best I've seen. Oh, it's great. up there. Go check it out while it's still there before they make them pull it down again. It is what it is. What else we got, Wade? Uh, last last the, bit for TV. What? Last for TV? Last for TV, and then we're going to do a few docs and uh, maybe some family stuff and other junk. You know, there, there's, honestly, Mark, here, this we got to talk about some of these. No, we don't. Yeah we, yeah, we do. Oh, yeah, we do. Those last two, those bottom two there, oh, you, I brought those along specially for you today. Oh, I did. I'm going to leave them with you. This is because they, they're meaningful to you. Dennis the Menace, season one, folks, finally out at long freaking last. All 32 episodes back from the day in the 60s when they actually, in the 50s and 60s actually, when they actually made a lot of episodes. Jay North uh, really made a career for himself in the, uh, is playing the famous Hank Ketchum cartoon character. And normally when they've tried to do cartoons or daily comics as television shows, they don't really work. Uh, they tried it on a number of occasions, uh, and it's it's always kind of sort of flopped a little bit. The uh, But Dennis the Menace was the one that worked. This is the original first season from 1959-1960, and uh, really very, very funny. The characters are just perfect. Uh, you know, Billy Booth is great as Tommy. Um, Jay North, absolutely fantastically believable as... Um, as Dennis, and then the real star of the show, as far as I'm concerned, the one that really makes the whole thing just hum, is Joseph Kearns as Mr. Wilson. And uh, a better Mr. Wilson, I think, doesn't look as much like Mr. Wilson as Walter Matthau did in the film, but a better Mr. Wilson overall. No, I love Walter Matthau. I know, I do too, but this, the show's really good. It's a very fun show. We get some interesting bonus features. A little trip down memory lane with some of the original cast members and a bonus episode, which was kind of a weird little crossover episode from the uh, Donna Reed show, which uh, they did even back then, just like my favorite crossover episode between Simon and Simon and Magnum P.I. I can't stop talking about Magnum P.I. today. I don't know why, Mark. Tell us the story about the one where uh, a Magnum uh, shoots the Vietnam vet or something like that. And you, it's, you... Oh, it's, it's Bo, Bo Svensson when he plays Ivan. He says, Ivan, did you see the sunrise? Bam! Freeze frame on the gun. No way. Magnum just murdered a dude. It was awesome. Legendary <laughs> moment really in television just, history. Did you really say Magnum just, uh, just murdered a dude? I did. I did. No, I was, was, is I was that what they with said my... in the show? No, oh, you said that. I said that. I was sitting there with my friend RJ, and we both like popped out of our seats and went and started bouncing up and down like bobbleheads going, no way, no way. Magnum just murdered a dude. Magnum just murdered a dude. It was awesome. It was oh. gutsy. That's when television had guts, man. Oh, yeah. Guts. Uh, a couple of, you know what, we're, we're running out of time here, but uh, let me make a, a big plug for a couple of things. Hang on. Hold on. Uh, okay. Cool it, baby. Did you see Cool It, Mark? No, because I don't like those. those the... Cool It is great, man. Cool uh, It is you, great. You're out of your mind. It is great. No, I'll tell you, I, I really love this, and not just because my wife was uh, a little bit involved in it, but uh, Bjorn Lomberg is this amazing guy who has been just unfairly maligned for a long time. And uh, this is a documentary all about Bjorn Lomberg. L- Bjorn Lomberg is basically a statistician who has become kind of a big proponent for a new approach to, to dealing with climate change. Everybody on the left, everybody on the right, they all hate him. People on the right hate him because he actually says climate change exists. People on the left hate him because he says Al Gore is, is just, just spazzing out for no reason whatsoever. And this documentary, it's like it finds the middle ground. It just deals with all the facts. And he just says, this is how we combat a real problem without hysteria, without misrepresentation, without politicizing it. And honestly, get it, watch it, show it to your friends, talk about it, invite all of your lefty friends and all of your righty friends, get those evangelicals and those progressives in the room together and tell them you can't talk about abortion, but you got to talk about Cool It. You are going to love it. You're all going to agree. The world will come. It'll be, gr- it'll be peace. World peace will ensue. It'll, it'll be dogs and cats. Dogs and cats <laughs> living together. Yes, it will. Yes, it will indeed. Oh, mule Actually, shoe. very, very funny reference. Yesterday... Uh, when we were doing, we we're doing a little bit of shooting this weekend. Um, uh, our, our good friend Sean, the cinematographer, made a comment about pulling back the camera to Cleveland. Quick movie reference. To Cle- back the camera because I, I said, "Can you pull back?" And he said, uh, "How do you? W- w- how about Cleveland?" Quick, what's that from? Uh, Groundhog. Day. You have two seconds. Tootsie. Oh. 
pull back. Can you make can you make her look better? I want to pull back a little. How do you feel about Cleveland? Oh yeah, I remember that.